is the clicker back on this thing or is it on that thing? The clicker is, you can do it either way. Can it's just, it's I, in here and you can, can use. Can I just do this? And you can do that. Can yep. I do that? Yep. You can ignore this and okay. do that. Because right. Cindy's going to introduce you real quick. Right. So if you want to. Hello? Okay. Should I start, Janet? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to see you. Um, my name is Ksenia Gerstein, and I'm the curator of modern contemporary art here at the Ulrich. And on behalf of myself and my colleagues who are standing in the back there, um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's talk by um, by artist Hockey A.V. Edgar Heap of Birds. Edgar's talk is part of our Voices from the Vault, the 1990s series of lectures conceived by Jana Irwin, who just stepped away for a sec, um, to allow the Ulrich to engage with some of the gems in our collection in anticipation of our 50th anniversary in 2024. Um, before I introduce Edgar, I would like to acknowledge that the city of Wichita occupies the traditional homelands and hunting and camping territories of several Native American nations, the Kiowa, the Osage, the Wichita, and the people of the Seven Council Fires. Today, the state of Kansas remains home to four federally recognized tribes, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. The land where we find ourselves tonight is indispensably connected to indigenous people past, present, and future. And on behalf of the Ulrich, I would like to honor the indigenous people of the Americas as stewards of this land who survived unimaginable hardships brought by colonization and to welcome the opportunity tonight to grow in our understanding of indigenous ways of knowing. And I would also, where's Lori? I would also uh, like to say a huge thank you to um, art education professor Lori Santos, who shared with me the research she's been doing um, as I was working on this land acknowledgement. So Edgar Heap of Birds is an artist, activist, and teacher. He lives in Oklahoma City and on the Cheyenne Arapaho Nation Reservation in Oklahoma, and is one of the leaders of the traditional Elk Warrior Society of the Cheyenne people. As both an artist and advocate for indigenous communities worldwide, Edgar has made work that includes text-based pieces, public art, large-scale drawings, paintings, prints, works in glass, and monumental outdoor sculpture, some of which, quite a bit of which I hope he'll show us tonight. Edgar's connection to Kansas is a deep one. He was born in Wichita, encountered as a young man the legendary Black Bear Boson, and received his BFA from the University of Kansas, which named him a distinguished alumnus in 2014. Edgar has spent 30 years teaching very close to here at the University of Oklahoma, where he is now Professor Emeritus of Na in the Native American Studies Department. Um, his work has been exhibited at a very long list of institutions, and I'll just give you a, a number of highlights. Um, Museum of Modern Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art, National Gallery of Canada, Museum of Contemporary Art, Sydney, and at a number of uh, major biennials such as or whatever Documenta is, whatever every five years show is called, but Documenta in Castle, Venice Biennial, and Site Santa Fe, among others. Uh, his works are found in the permanent collections of such institutions as the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Denver Art Museum, Museum of Contemporary Native American Art in Santa Fe, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So we at the Ulrich are very pleased to be part of such a, an illustrious list of institutions where Edgar's work is kept and is available for uh, the general public. So lastly, 
I'm almost done. Before I hand the podium over to Edgar, I'd like to acknowledge Humanities Kansas, a nonprofit cultural organization that connects communities with history, traditions, and ideas to strengthen civic life. Uh, HK's generous grant funding has made the Voices from the Vault series possible for us this year, and we're really grateful to them for their support. And now, my part thankfully is over, and the really fun part will begin. Welcome, Edgar. Thank you for the welcome. It's great to see everybody. And I saw, I've been greeted by a couple of buddies, uh, Jimmy Hill and Ron Owen, and from uh, middle school and maybe third grade. I don't know. But I could, and we all got older. I don't know what happened with that. I don't know. What happened? What's up with that? Um, but, but I went to the Indian Center today too and uh, was able to look at you know, Black Bear Boson's work. And, and I worked there uh, as a museum uh, curator back in 76. And uh, uh, so it was great to go back and look at some of the document documents from Plainview, they call the, the wartime housing you know, where I grew up. Um, so I, I, I do have deep, deep roots here. I mean, it's, it's beyond roots. It's uh, in my psyche. And, uh, and so it's, it's interesting to come back and, and to think about maybe re-engaging with this community here you know as well i brought some cards i have a project up at ku at the spencer and so i i made some car or they made some cards for me at the spencer museum and uh, we we acknowledge the native tribes that have reservations here in kansas and yes they do have reservations in kansas you know people don't really understand that but there's five uh, nations here on the table and i want to give them away you know to to anyone that, that's interested uh, when the sh when the talk's over with, you're welcome to have have a handful of these. Uh, uh, they're, they're intervention uh, documents that I've done, uh, public art pieces. Uh, there's five up at KU, you know. But uh, to begin, I have a couple of acknowledgments um, to start the talk tonight. And uh, the main one, uh, well, the first one, uh, is going to just uh, be an, uh, a way to honor the the, the tribes that came here. And, and, uh, and I have deep feelings about this part of it in that uh, this place called Wichita, Kansas is like a, a destination that was a very kind of troubling experiment in assimilation. You know, the Black Bear Boson, I'll show his work in a little bit, but uh, he was one of those uh, people that came here to struggle, you know, and he came here as an aircraft worker a metal worker. And so during the Cold War and after World War II, during the Vietnam War, uh, many Native people came from the 39 nations of Oklahoma because it was so hard to live there, so troubling to live there. They came here to get to get labor, to get work. And they, they made it. They did pretty well. Many of them did. And then the second generation had a lot of failure, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of problems and violence, and, uh, and it continues. And many people moved back to the reservation, as did my family. And, and I returned, too, in the 80s. And I've been back since the 80s. But I want to honor uh, 30 families that were here, that probably maybe are still here. And they came to really fight that good fight against assimilation and to survive uh, in this place called Wichita, Kansas. Wusapiti, Sepahoodle, Hunter, Morris Back, Toya Koya, Longs, Jonico, Doibai, Stumbling Bear, Tosi, Gulado, Ware, Begay, Buffalo Head, Hamilton Street, Half Moon, Old Bear, Two Hatchet, Shenantona, Thornton, White Rack, Rock, Green Feather, Moses, Stevens, Cable, uh, no, no nigh, squirrel, star, and flying coyote. So those are some of the families that me and my brothers and my sisters uh, got together and discussed which ones they remembered. And we were all here together. So we we're six kids in the family. And my brother is still somewhere in this town, but uh, everyone else moved back to the reservation, you know, years ago. And, and we get together all the time. We're a real close family. And I'll be maybe going home tonight, maybe in the morning. But uh, but it's, it's it's very important to have that homeland. And 
And I think many people really realized, and certainly taught their children, that Oklahoma is the homeland, and, and and Kansas was a was a a stop on the way back home, you know, in a way maybe. So I want to acknowledge those. Okay, are the lights going to get a little dimmer, or is that is that it? Is that it? Okay. Um, so I want to I start with this horizon uh, that those families came from, and this is the Oklahoma horizon, looking west from Oklahoma City, um, and I want to. First, uh, next, acknowledge uh, an elder, uh, uh, Alice, um, lightning woman, heap of birds, and she was also a howling crane, uh, Cheyenne woman, and this is my grandmother, um, and my my father's mother, and uh, I was very close to her, and so she sent her boy up here, and her boy became a worker at Beach Aircraft. And that's uh, his sister, and they're both gone. Um, so taken many years ago, maybe in the 40s, that photograph. And then I'll show you how we've kind of progressed. This is a, a lightning woman uh, during the 80s. And that's me as a much younger man who looks like me a little bit. Uh, and uh, she stood with me with those word pieces. Uh, and we had a view camera, and it took all night to take that shot. So I'm, I'm very proud of my grandma. She stood with me in many other ways as well. And that's what we don't want to be. We don't want to be a folkloric distraction for America. Um, so she married a, 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 a boy, a young man, um, as a child. His name was Guy Heap of Birds. He was named Guy Heap of Birds. He's on the far left. Uh, very important is his mother in the center, Grace Big Bear. And then the gentleman holding the pipe is Black Wolf, and Black Wolf, very important um, leader of the Cheyenne Nation. He was the leader of the Elk Warrior Society, and now I'm one of the leaders of the Elk Warrior Society. His father was Moyuhun Haskus, magpie birds, many of them together. So uh, many magpies later became heap of birds in that language, and he was a chief of the tribe, uh, his father. Uh, Black Bear Bosun, of course, was here and uh, came Kiowa Comanche uh, Nation, those nations in Oklahoma, and he worked as an aircraft worker, um, became an artist, self-trained, self-taught, and I was privileged to know him, and he showed me some of the work he was doing. He showed me a model of the sculpture. He showed me the mural that's at the Native American Center right now, and so I was really privileged to be able to know him. Uh, we weren't great friends, and you know, he doesn't probably, he would never even think of me, you know, but that's okay. But uh, I thought of him. So he led us uh, forward to be artists. And that's what we needed. We need role models and people that, that lead the way to become artists. It's very hard to be an artist. I made a, this is a print installation. Uh, I think it's called an Indian Home. But on the, in the middle there, uh, one of the dark red panels on top, urban for Indian Village in Wichita. So this is all about growing up and some of it being in Oklahoma, some of it being in Kansas. But I'll show you more about these prints later, but there is a Wichita um, message there. And then my father, Charles Heap of Birds, um, his Cheyenne name was Many Magpies. His, his mother named him Many Magpies. And we're, right now we're doing, we're planning a major exhibit uh, in Brooklyn, and it'll be about unions, labor union uh, uprisings and the connection with collectives with tribal people, that unions and, and tribes are similar. Uh, so I made this print in Santa Fe last week that many magpies, he's a union man at Beach Aircraft. Uh, Black Bear, again, made the, the mural that was at the bank and um, now it's down at the Indian Center in his exhibition, which I, I hope you go to see if you haven't seen it already. But he, he showed me that mural when he was working on it. And it was great to see. I was very impressed with his work. And I still love that painting a great deal. And this is his, probably his most prominent work, Prairie Fire. And it's been celebrated in New York. Um, it, was, it was put in the catalog called the Anti-Catalog against the Whitney Museum uh, when they were trying to fight for equal rights at the Whitney. Um, and they used this painting to discuss equality in that the fire is beautiful 
uh, the animals are with the fire, the people are with the fire. And so there isn't a hierarchy, you know, in, in this depiction of nature and people and animals. And so that was well respected as a, as a value. So um, this is, is the 100th anniversary of Black Bear's birth. So the first thing I did when I came here was to put some tobacco down for the old man down at the keeper. You know, so it's something that we, we, we have a lot of respect, certainly for what he's accomplished and shared. And, and I wanna make that clear. Uh, my first painting, uh, University of Kansas, and probably 1973, as I was a sophomore, and I took a uh, painting, um, um, and this is a six foot by six foot uh, canvas. And so the prairie and the horizon is very much what uh, we reflect upon. All, even my necklace, you know, the, the, the diagonals and so forth, the straight lines, uh, those are from the mountains and from the prairie. Uh, so it was a subliminal kind of uh, trait that I uh, depicted there, and it, go, it went on to make other more sculptural forms. Uh, this is a construction, again, KU, uh, probably senior year, and uh, I would use this work to enter graduate school at the Royal College of Art in London and be admitted to go to the RCA in, in, in South Kensington, um, and um, I had other mentors in my career I wanted to acknowledge as well. Uh, this is a, a work that I did with Don Secondine, who's a Delaware artist. And he worked at the Indian Center here in Wichita, Kansas. He went to KU, he went to Haskell. He studied with Dr. West at Haskell, as I, I knew Dr. West as well. Um, but he had a, a, a mother-in-law who died, she was Kiowa. Uh, she was a Chano, and so Don and I were taking a landscape painting class with a professor called Sudlow, and we would go out in this uh, suburban truck, and and they would paint landscape easel paintings, but we would make earthworks. We didn't really want to make easel paintings, uh, so we made this memorial to his his mother, his his wife's mother. Uh, so we got a tree and then we put stones at the bottom of it. Before that, we painted it, and we put cedar in the middle, kind of for, for the ghost, for the spirits, and at the top, we put um, one of Don's, uh, he had some horse tails he was, he was doing sculpture with, and it sort of presented a woman's hair blowing in the wind. And so I, I show this because, you know, Don showed me, uh, kind of gave me some guidance about memorials, and, and certainly now I'm, I'm sort of, world known for making these memorials for native native people that have passed on, whether it's Minnesota or all over the 38th, they were hung by Abraham Lincoln. I've done all those pieces, but the first one was actually in a landscape painting class with, with Dawn Secondine. Uh, this is a moccasin that my grandmother had beaded. I've made a screen print, a serigraph from the moccasin. You see again, all of the angular forms, very geometrical forms that are indicative of Cheyenne, but indicative of the horizon. And so I took this with me to go to Philadelphia uh, as a reference. And I took this with me to go forward uh, to finish my Master of Fine Arts degree at Tyler School of Art in Philly. Um, it was a tough go uh, through Philadelphia and a very, you know, very important art school, but very much in the Anglo tradition of formalism. And so we didn't have any uh, professors of color at all at my art school. Um, and um, so it, I struggled. And, but it, it, it kind of gave me the impetus to be kind of in your face with my messages because people try to deflect the native history that I was trying to articulate. And I guess I still do that. I'm still pretty much in your face with a lot of things. And, um, this piece is called Fort Marion Lizards. And I had researched the Fort Marion Odyssey of, uh, after the massacre at Washita, uh, Colonel Custer's army and the Cheyenne Rapaho people. They took our leaders, many magpies, hockey avi, about 30 or so Cheyenne chiefs and Warrior Society members and made them POWs in Florida, in St. Augustine, Florida. And so they held them hostage away from their families. 
and I found the list that the captain had written himself, Captain Pratt. And I took the list and made a painting, uh, eight foot by eight foot. And my name's at the top of the list, uh, Hippo Birds. And that was by the hand of uh, Captain Pratt. He put them at, at the top of the list. Here are the warriors in prison uh, in St. Augustine. And so it's, it's a tactic to hold you hostage in the American government. And they hope to keep everyone else in check as they hold the leaders in, in, as hostages. Um, and some came back, some died in Florida. But we still struggle to uh, regain our composure and our leadership from the day that our, all of our leaders were in prison. This is Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo Bay. And tonight, these men are, are, are in captivity again. And who knows what's happening to them? There's no trials. There's no charges. There's, there's just they're being, being held by the USA uh, as hostages. And so that, that tactic that was uh, perpetrated against Cheyenne warriors and chiefs goes toward um, the Islamic world right now. So again, there's no trials, no charges, no release. Uh, when I was in grad school, I could not have a kind of a great homecoming of my art to the native community. Um, Cheyennes were all in Oklahoma and no one had any money to go to Philadelphia. And so I came upon an idea that was very, very principal, very provocative, but very important to me. And that was, I should just take these red letters and write my names in the gallery. And that was part of the exhibition. There, was, there were other paintings and sculptures, but I wrote about six of my names in the gallery. And so today you see you know, a lot of that in my, in my process. So Howling Crane, was Lining Woman's name also. Uh, this is a, a piece, uh, kind of a complex work, and I show it because it's gonna be going to the Museum of Modern Art uh, next year. It'll be part of a, a, a show about a, a art space called Just Above Midtown, they call it Jam, and it was a very exciting, cutting edge art space in 1981, and so a colleague, in, uh, his name is Peter Jamison. He's a Seneca man. He and I were delegates from a native gallery in, in Soho to go show in this other space, which was sort of multicultural, although we didn't say that back then. But uh, so it was great. And Anna Mendieta was in the exhibit. David Hammonds was in the exhibit. Dawood Bay was in the, in the exhibit. Uh, Marin Hashinger. So like the who's who of the art world as young characters were, were in this show. And so I, I made this piece just for the exhibit. And uh, I was dealing with a lot of, uh, not hostility, but kind of a lot of misunderstanding and expectations in Philadelphia because no one understood native people very well in Philadelphia because they'd moved them all to Oklahoma. You know, the Delawares are in Oklahoma. Lena Lenape's are in Oklahoma. So they were kind of intrigued, but they thought you should always uh, entertain them by giving them some Indian uh, we call them coyote stories. You know, they want some coyote stories. Everyone likes a few coyote stories. And so I made a fake set of coyote stories. And so everyone in New York was reading these across the panel like it was a glossary and say, woo-ha must mean fun and so on. But actually all the things on the left are animals. That's not what this is on the right. So it's called understanding the uniqueness of an ethnic entity. It's so unique, they might be lying to you and you don't even know it. So that'll be in New York again. They'll be, they'll be tricked again at, at MoMA next year. So I went to London, the Royal College of Art, and had a studio uh, at the V&A Museum and uh, met a lot of great artists and professors and it was a very a big awakening for me. Uh, but what it did was it brought me back to Oklahoma where I never lived because my father was here in Wichita working for Beach. And, uh, but I knew I had to go back and I went back uh, for the summer, made that print with my grandmother's moccasin, then went to Philadelphia. This is the Royal Albert Hall. And on the far left, there is a Royal College of Art uh, on Kensington Gore. And I received scholarships to travel in the continent and I was all over in Florence, uh, 
through Switzerland, through to see the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam and the Riviera to see the work uh, in, uh, in, you know, the southern part of France. And um, so very important to see the great works and to see the Vatican and all these things. Uh, but, it, but it brought me back home to Oklahoma. And this is the land of Oklahoma, the Red Rock, the ancient sea. Millions of years ago, this was a sea. That's why it's, it's got sand in it. And I lived there on the reservation, my mother's land, my, my, my Arapaho grand, grandmother's land, uh, for about 10 years. Uh, and the trees were very important, uh, the juniper trees. And it was just out of uh, necessity or boredom or whatever. But I, but I hunted every day. I hiked every day. Had no money. Had no water to turn on. Had no electricity to turn on. <laughs> had no road to drive on. Um, had an outhouse down the hill. But um, but it, it was it was you know look back and romantically, but it was a very wonderful time to learn from the earth. And that's where indigeneity begins. It's in the earth. It's not in people. And so if you're indigenous and you want to really reflect on what that is, you have to love a place. You have to be in a place. And so that place west of Gary, Oklahoma, is my, my place. Uh, this is a photograph my son took. His name is Wootgim. And he took this, this tree that had died, but uh, on top of the Kiowa Comanche territory where Black Bear is from, uh, Mount Scott, down by Anadarko. And that's the first painting I made in the canyon. Um, I was pretty lost and confused. And so I could not readjust myself from being on the East Coast, being in Philadelphia, showing in New York, and then being on this canyon of 500 acres. Um, and so I took a, a little piece of like Walmart canvas board <clears throat> and built an easel out of some scrap lumber and walked down into this little Roro and made this painting, and then it began the Nuf series. Nuf is to do something four times. Um, and so I made that sort of the, the nucleus of the whole career began from this painting. And then it went forward into the more word art, more politicized discussion um, and discourse. Uh, next to that is my vase from Murano, Italy. And I did the, the Venice Biennale, and I did a bunch of glass blowing made some I think, wonderful pieces. Uh, so there's a relationship with the shapes. Many of the years later, there is a, a larger Nuf painting, and that's in the collection of the St. Louis Museum of Art. And I was very proud to go there one day. I, was, I did another piece that's up right now in the Native American section of the museum. And they said to me, they said, Edgar, your, your Nuf painting is up in modern art. You gotta go look at it. And so I was just like very scared. like. Uh, they put me next to Bryce Martin and Joan Mitchell. They put me in the, like, like sitting next to Picasso. Like, I don't want to go up there. I don't wanna, it's not going to work out so well. You know? And uh, I, I finally went up there, and there I am next to Bryce Martin. And um, the curator said, "I like yours better." You know? And and I, I and I do feel the Nuf painting holds its own with Bryce Martin and Joan Mitchell as well. So. Um, that's sort of the the real telltale of you, if you if you can hold your own with the champions of an abstract painting. And these are uh, 89 by 105. These are pretty big canvases, uh, and it's about the movement, about sort of something coming out of the land in a way, like the, maybe the quail flying or the the clouds blowing by, and then later it became about the fish in this tropics, and I would be in Samoa, I'd be in Gulf of Thailand, I'd be off the Great Barrier Reef or down in the Virgin Islands, or and I'd be with my family and be with the fish. And so that's informed me as well. And there's a red series called Nufs for Autumn. We're showing this in New York uh, in January. And another reference to the sea, uh, that's the volcano in Bali. And I worked in Bali and Lombok and Java, and also really, really enjoyed being in Sumatra, too. So I was in the water uh, snorkeling with a volcano above me. And that's a, an elder, brilliant artist that does weaving. And the back 
of the slide, you'll see some of our weavings hanging. And so when I'm traveling, I really do my best to, to communicate with communities that are indigenous and share ideas, share artwork. And uh, she was really a beautiful uh, person that, that wove those pieces. And this is in Sumatra near a lake called Lake Toba, this ancient crater of this volcano. And these were done uh, for the show at the Pomona Museum of Art in LA. And I was working with an elder uh, tribe, it's called the uh, Tongva. And so uh, she, she was helping me understand the history of the Tongva nation. I made some public art for them. And she wanted to work all in blue as a renewal color of, of water. And so I made four blue paintings, there's two of them here. Um, my public art, in many ways began in New York City in 1988. I was asked to come back to New York and I was joining uh, a very important uh, group of artists uh, that did work on the Times Square billboard. No, 82, in 82, this is 82. There was only one billboard in Times Square at that time, if you can believe that. And we had, it was 40 feet by 20 feet. And so we all had a month it was sort of a commission thing, not much money, but they picked you. And um, so with my group, there was uh, Hans Hocke, uh, Keith Herring, Billy Sullivan, Jane Dixon, David Hammonds, Jenny Holzer, Barbara Kruger. So the leading artists uh, of the world, of, of the American world, uh, had a, a, a month to put a piece up. And it ran every 20 minutes, you made a message. And so my message, I can't show you the whole thing, but uh, it's, it's about the Cheyenne, the Tatistas, is the real word for Cheyenne, said Viho, spider. Tatistas said Viho, wrapped up. Tatistas said Viho, trap you. Tatistas said Viho, catch you. And so in the Cheyenne language, white man is, is uh, Viho. Viho is a spider. So all the things they do with the fences and the marking, the, the gritting, all the things that they made to the earth, like a spider catching things, you know. And I put that up uh, at Times Square. Um, I came back in 88, and I was asked again by the Public Art Fund to um, work on a project with uh, whatever I wanted to do. So uh, this time I wanted to talk about New York tribal people. And so I turned New York around backwards, the first time I've done that. And then I made them look at their past differently. And I said, today your host is Mohawk. Uh, today your host is Seneca, Tuscarora, Onondaga, um, Warpo, Manhattan, Shinnecock, all these names. And it led to a whole series called Native Hosts. And I've done it across America and I'm still working. I have the five up at KU right now. We have some in Boston coming up. There's some in Florida. This was in Utah. And we work also to correct the name, the misspelling of, of the tribal name. So Ute doesn't exist, that word is wrong. So the real word is Nuchi. And these are students at the University of Utah. And that was in um, Florida in Key West. And I'm kind of proud to say that I put it up at Ernest Hemingway's house. And we cut the water line, we just buried it back together. So. Here's more. Well, I was working down there with the art, art group uh, in Key West. My son and I, Wootkin, were down there. And this is a permanent uh, set of pieces at Crystal Bridges in Arkansas and Bentonville. And there's seven Native nations. Uh, and they have a good video online you can watch and learn about this. Uh, Oklahoma, the Sooners, um, put that up on campus, and I made one for every professor that I that was native that I knew, and ran the Sooners back the other direction when they get their cover wagons out. They, I turn them around, run them back to St. Louis the other way, flip them around. And that's Julia Bagani. Julia was the elder, the Tongva elder, and uh, Robert Redford uh, built a new. Uh, Global Studies Center, I think it's a climate center on the Pitzer College campus. And so we had 20 of these uh, sacred site uh, notif no notifiers and, and we, they collected four 
for the campus to remain, and one's over at, at Redford's place. And we did an inauguration there. Uh, they sang songs, uh, the Tongva. Uh, this is downtown LA. I had a show uh, in a gallery in, in LA. And one of my favorite is, I think it's pretty funny, it's the one with a cruise ship coming in to uh, St. Croix. You know? And so it's a real challenge to, to give rebuttal to all of these kind of this mistaken identities and they're coming there to hear reggae music or to see a carnival with people in the Middle Passage and African American, all these kind of things. But they're not thinking at all about Taino, about the different uh, specific native tribes. So I made, I think, five panels in St. Croix and then we um, put this, I left them there, so my guys put them up all the time, just kind of guerrilla activity, put them up on the beach and stuff. So you have to acknowledge the Taino when you come to St. Croix. And that's the work in Can at KU, the call. So there's a call, call sign up here as well. There's five nations, I think, up there at KU in front of the Spencer Art Museum. And I was working also in Anchorage, and a wonderful trip to Anchorage, and met artists, you know, there, and they really appreciated this work uh, in Anchorage. And uh, so, what happens is there's such pride in in finally having your your nation recognized in a public venue, and specifically if they can stay, if they can stay erected in the ground. And so, everyone wants their selfie taken by their sign. You know, it's like it's great. Um, and so, they acquired uh, 20 of those, or maybe 24. Uh, Native Nations in Anchorage, and when, in Anchorage, I met a lot of you know great community people. But I went to uh, the Sound South, Prince William or Philip Sound, about an hour and a half south of Anchorage, and and got on this this really big boat and was able to cruise up the Sound for two hours and get to the glacier. You know. And then we were so privileged to have that ice come on board, you know? And so you, you can bless yourself with this ice that's thousands and thousands of years old. And it's amazing to touch that ice and encounter that, that history in the, in the sea. Um, so it's wonderful to be there in South of Anchorage. Uh, I've been painting, I guess, more uh, basically in the tropics. I've been, um, I go to Hawaii a lot. I do some printmaking in Honolulu. Um, but I've been certainly, you know, in Australia and as I said, Samoa, but I work, I spent a lot of time in Asia, but also in the Caribbean. And, um, I paint with, uh, this vision of being in the water with my daughter snorkeling or my sons there sometimes. Uh, and we're, we're like, like mammals in the water, you know, with the other, the other fish and the coral. And so this is my little bit of the process here, the, uh, they're small wooden panels. They're uh, 12 by 16. And so I have a suitcase that's a traveling suitcase studio. And I check it, and American carries it for me, American Airlines, and takes it where I want to go. Um, and then I, I'll paint on the lanai, which is a, like a fancy word for a porch, back porch. And I've been painting in St. St. Thomas and in Honolulu and, uh, well, the North Shore of Oahu and uh, Kauai. Uh, I'll be in Kona uh, in the middle of December, and I'm making these paintings. These are blue ones, but I really like how they're going. You know, I really feel good about these. And they're, and they're wooden panels, so they're very durable in how they travel, but they're also it's very uh, acutely uh, uh, aware. Of, you, you're very aware of how to make the shapes because the, the wood is so strong. It's not a canvas. There's no tooth to it, so. Um, I make, I've made, a, you know, probably 20, 30 of these paintings and I'll start a new set uh, in December. And that's the sea between St. John and St. Thomas, really a really nice sea with, with reefs and so forth. We were there just about two months ago and we'll be going back, uh, I think in the spring or summer. But these are the paintings I, I started in, in uh, St. Croix. And I, and I've been to a, I went to a dig early. In my in my life uh, to find, watch them unearth Taino ceramics, 
And uh, I remember those sort of sand colored ceramics. And so I, I um, titled these uh, Nooks for the Taino. And here they are finished. Uh, I finished them up in upstate New York. Um, there's an artist named Ai Weiwei from China. And we stayed at his house and, um, and I painted on the back porch of Ai Weiwei's house and finished these paintings. And now they're in a collection in New York. Um, I, so I take all this, you know, earth awareness and the sea very, very, you know, serious. And uh, just about two weeks ago, the Denver Art Museum reinstalled my, my sculpture called Wheel at the Denver Art Museum. And it's in front of the, the new addition of the museum, the Lieberskin building. Um, and so this is a, an older photograph when it was installed in 2005. Now it's back out. It's a, it's a medicine wheel, uh, much like the wheel that's in Wyoming and the Bighorn Mountains. And it has a kind of autobiographical story of uh, the massacres, the um, prisoner of war time, and and then the, the voyage to, to Wichita in a way to be a worker, but then to come back home and become a ceremonial leader. Um, all those things together are indicated on these trees, these red trees made of porcelain and steel, and uh, thus the many magpies flying, which was actually painted uh, in Fort Marion prison uh, by one of the Cheyenne warriors. And that's my daughter, uh, Lightning Woman. She's now 12 years old. And I was showing her the sculpture uh, when we were in Denver a couple years ago. Uh, her first name is Desba. It means a, war a warrior woman goes out and fights and comes back. She's, she's Navajo and Shawn Arapaho. Um, I worked also in Beijing and Shanghai. And in my Shanghai, in my Beijing uh, part, of the, part of the project, I was very fortunate to have a poster created for me by an artist, a graphic designer in Beijing, and she used the wheel to make this poster. And so it was great to see that kind of sentiment, that kind of history travel across the world and become this Chinese poster in Chinese and in English uh, in, in Beijing. And I talked to them about another perspective because I went to Tiananmen Square, and of course you think about the violence that happened there, but um, they brought out the Statue of Liberty as this uh, savior, you know, and uh, the same colleague I mentioned earlier, Peter Jameson, he made the remark to me that in New York Harbor, the Statue of Liberty had its back to all the Indians. It's not facing us, it's welcoming everybody else. So I told them in China, don't believe Miss Liberty. I don't believe her. And I made this piece after Tiananmen Square and I showed it in, in Beijing. Um, with those ideas of the medicine wheel from Denver, um, uh, probably my most uh, joyous time is to work with elders in my tribe, a place called Watonga. And I, they got together a special meeting of all these, about 400 Sean Rappel elders. And we did a painting workshop and we created these medicine wheels and we talked about, you know, the importance of the certain star systems that align above us. And, and so certainly, you know, we have to, we have to acknowledge and admit that not all the elders know the protocols of the ceremony, you know, you might think they do, but they don't, you know, so, so it's, it's important for the leaders like myself to uh, share those ideas, you know, with, with the community. And so we did this through this painting. Everyone had a one foot canvas and my mother was there. My sister was there. Everybody was there. It was great in Watonga. Um, I'm also supportive of uh, other tribes. And so I did a project in Atlanta, um, Trail of Tears. So that's not the Cheyenne nation, but the, all those tribes, Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, all those tribes that came to Oklahoma from the Southeast. And so I made these uh, no parking signs and put them up in downtown Atlanta. And so my, my theme there was, uh, your time's up, it's time to go. You know, Parking's over, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta move, move along. And so I put them up all along Peachtree Street, you know, talking about when it's time to move along and your parking's over. Um, and if you wanna be a power walker and, and exercise, 
try walking to Oklahoma from Atlanta. You'll be very fit when you get here. No, I guarantee that. And I've worked with youth on making signs. This was a workshop I did a few summers ago in uh, Vermilion, South Dakota. I think it's the Oscar Howe Institute, Summer Institute at the University of South Dakota. And it was really a great group of students, all native students, some college, some high school. Um, and they made their own messages and we put them out in a big 50 foot circle. And they had their own ideas and it took like it was about three days to do all this work and very proud of what they had to say. Um, and so we made an intervention right there on campus and they toured it across South Dakota. And it's a, it's a workshop that goes on every summer. They bring in new students and, and new mentors like myself to help direct that effort. And she's a student at Yale. I saw her, I gave a talk at Yale two years ago and I saw her, she came to my talk. Uh, and a Navajo student there as well. I've also been uh, kind of um, called back to my graduate school, the Tyler School of Art, part of Temple University. And I've gotten an award uh, there as alumni as well. And so they asked me to make a diploma. So I made a, a special uh, monoprint. And then the students there turned it into a serigraph, a, a screen print. And then every student that graduated from Tyler was handed one as their diploma. So I made that learn, share, lead. And there they are very happy with their, their prints. So they got something out of it. They got a print. But I'm, I'm really happy about this. And there's not many selfies on Instagram with them holding their print, you know, and pretty, pretty cool. I did a vote print also um, with a group for the election against racism 2020. And then another proud moment, of course, is my, my piece on the cover of Art in America. And I was given the cover of Art in America and um, I made a special monoprint and um, so that, that piece was discussing how Native artists should not dance for pay. They should not cater to, to what the non-Natives want to have from Native art. They should be, I think, very critical of the society and what's befallen the Native people. And if they don't speak out against it, everyone thinks everything's fine. So Wichita has a lot of work to do about that. They need to work on that because there's not much critical discourse here about the native history. Um, and you have to think about certainly something as direct as wheat. You know, wheat is grown because Indians were killed and moved off of this land. That's why wheat's here. So they sh I'm in the shocker place, <laughs> but the wheat's a deadly thing. They, they brought the army first to move the Wichita's to Texas and Oklahoma. So they're not here anymore. So, um, so we have to talk about that. So do not dance for pay was made. And then if you see at the top, I was able to reverse America backwards too, you know? And, and so I think it's important to have very large missions and, and wishes, you know, that can go forward in the, in the future. And, and I would never think this, this was possible, but it, it certainly happened. And, and um, we got a lot accomplished with this magazine cover. I have a piece now in Switzerland and it's in Zurich. Uh, Swiss Bodmer captured his Indians from their Missouri homelands, set us free. He was an artist like uh, Catlin. And so there's many, many artists that were non-native that painted Indians that have more exhibits than any Indian will ever have. You know, they keep showing Catlins over and over again. And they kind of replace living native people. We need to, we need to stop that. Uh, this was done also around the election time, kind of about uh, Trump's... Uh, uh, issues with immigration billboard in California. And that's my uh, current style of printmaking, um, monoprints, uh, viscosity prints, and the left, the right, the left is, is primary prints. The right is, uh, is gonna be the um, ghost prints. And so the ghost print is a second pool from the plate. And so it, it, for me, it indicates the, the way people think of natives very faintly, very um, austere, pushed away. But the, on the left is the real vivid part. And that's a close up. These are all 22 by 30. 
uh, size prints. This is a uh, this is the piece about uh, water is your only medicine, and it has a whole series of of phrases about water. Here's one about the baby that we we were all inside of the water, we rested in the water. So water is the uh, it came from the comet that came and brought all the water on the planet, and we still rest in the water as as children. Um. And this is brand new work. I just was in Santa Fe last week making a new piece um, dealing with uh, the title uh, Tribal Lives Matter. I made 24 primary prints about the, the series of uh, massacres that have befallen Native people. And so as we discuss police violence and other kinds of uh, matters that are important, we need to remember the, the greatest violence was against the native people in this, this hemisphere. And so I made 24 prints in primary bright color and then 24 uh, in the ghost. There's a Sand Creek ghost print, Cheyenne massacres. Uh, the Pequot, they cut their heads off and put them on these pikes. So whenever they went to town, they'd see their chief's heads rotting on a, on a stick in uh, Connecticut. And then for me, um, as I talk about all this violence and, and uh, strife, you know, certainly I, do, I would declare that natives survive in spite of the empire. You know, we live under the, you know, under the shadow of the empire, but we survive in spite of the empire and with two ways of living. One is the ceremonial way with the sage, with the power of the spirit of the, of the prayers, and this is the sage from the ceremony. And then, of course, with your family. You know, the family is a core. Family is the most important for all of us here in this room, should be. And uh, my, my wife, Shanna Ketchum, Heap of Birds, PhD, Middlesex University of London, and my daughter, who just got inducted into the National uh, Honor Society as a seventh grader. Um, and very important. She's very artistic. She draws all the time as well. And uh, so that's the family there. I want to con conclude with a video, and it's from uh, an, an artist, Nick Caro. Um, it's called S S Spirit Citizen. And it's kind of low in the sound. I always talk about how painting doesn't ever stop. And the painters never quit painting, even when they're not painting. I mean, they're, they're going to go back and make that progression extend further. They should be exploring with the medium, you know, and reorganizing the configurations and the exploration and investigation. You got to articulate the ideas through a form, exploring new ways to articulate those shapes. Earth doesn't care about humans. The Earth has nothing to do with humans. And it's fine on its own. And it's been fine on its own. And, and you can kind of damage a little bit of things, but only as it pertains to humans. Like if you mess up the ozone, we get more sunburn. If you poison the water, we can't swim in it or drink it. It's spun before. It's going to spin after. But but people relate more to each other. And they think, and they think they're getting something done because they relate to each other. And then someday... The earth will move, tilt a bit, and get too close to the sun, and there'll be no more people here. And that's why the, the tribes are so have so much humility. We pay homage to where we are. That's what that's what we do every day on this planet. Is that we don't we're not bigger than it or more smarter than it. We just we're happy to be kind of hosted by it well, we're on the the allotment uh the north allotments north uh, arapaho family allotments my mother's and her relatives i moved here in the 80s the early 80s and i my great grandmothers they were very generous and allowed me to live uh, at the top of the hill 
and it had any, didn't have any running water and no electricity and it was a three room kind of old house but but living here was a was a real privilege and learning from the land the weather the animals and again that wasn't easy but uh i think it puts me in a good position to always be comfortable on the planet you know like i'm i'm comfortable wherever we are But I made, made a lot of the work. Actually, the work that the Whitney collected was made out here, you know. And a lot of the work that I've got, being shown in museums and so forth, uh, major museums in the world, was made out here. And it still resonates. Like, like every shape should be an, an entity when you're painting to me. Like every shape you make should be like a little animal spirit or it should have that weight. It's not an embellishment. It's like this tree is something. And you know, you know, like you look at a tree, you touch it or whatever. It's like, you gotta be like that tree's gotta be, have as much status as anything out here, you know? And then you overlay it, you know, overlay it, overlay it. And then you get this, like here, you get this strata of all this visual beauty. And, uh, but it comes from being in this environment for, you know, years, and a daily basis. It's become a language, a visual language for me, a visual language that can be repeated and I can explore anywhere, but, but it comes from the experience of being on the land as a young, young man and, and just continuing that, that relationship you know, in, in the work as well, as well as in physicality, but also in, in the work, it's going to, the homage to the, to the earth is going to be present. You know, as an artist, they need to be, live in a place that they can learn in. They need to be somewhere living on this earth that they pick, that they can learn, not the hippest place or the funnest place or the most money money place. Or, but you want to learn where you're, where you're sitting and sleeping every night. Where <laughs> you need to learn. It trickles down into being something very significant if you understood where you where you're sleeping, where you're living, and be you know citizens of that place and and take care of the spirit of those places. <laughs> Red bird. Comments, questions, whatever. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I'm also a KU graduate, so rock chalk. And, uh, <laughs> I, but I was curious to hear your thoughts on everything that happened with your installation, <laughs> um, if you're willing to share that. Oh man. Uh, well, we, you know these these five pieces. Uh, the museum did not handle them properly, I'm sorry to say, but they, they had one that they actually put, the car one, they, they bought this one first, and they put it in the ground properly with cement footings and so on. Their signs, about four feet tall, five feet tall. But, and then they, then they had five, four more, but they never really accurate, you know, correctly installed them, so they were just sitting in the dirt, which is beyond me. But, uh, and then students came and, and uh, stole them and bent them up and wrote all over them, but, but they were sort of vulnerable. And, uh, but there was some, some pushback from the KU students. Uh, it was chosen as they called the common work of art, which was the primary piece of art that they should study the whole, the whole university. And uh, I think they resented a little bit of that because it was native. You know, I don't think they were happy about that. And so some of them acted out and, and uh, tore it up and, and then, but then, you know, I, I believe, I, I do believe certainly that uh, public art is the com community's endeavor, you know. So if no one takes up for you and they trash your stuff, maybe it's not that good of a thing you made, you know. And 
And in Denver, they, there was a similar thing happened with my piece in Denver, but the whole world cried out and, and Denver did better with it. They changed their attitude and changed it all around and treasured it more. And so that's what happened at KU, that there was an outcry from Native students and faculty and people that it became stronger and more more defined, you know, what its meaning was. And and so um, I think that's, you know, it's an odd kind of maybe good thing, but I think it helped them understand the piece, you know, the history of, of Native people. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I made I made an Andrew Jackson print about the I call him the uh, president of ethnic cleansing, you know, and Lincoln's on the on the dollar on the five dollar whatever that is five dollar. So he 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 hung thirty eight Dakota warriors, and so yeah, well, that needs to change, and that we had to come out with that that kind of truth. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So. I have two questions about audience, um, and I, I'm really thinking about uh, how you often are making work um, to be put in front of an audience that's pretty ignorant about the issues that you're addressing. And I'm curious about how you think about that, and um, and you also make work with, uh, with other indigenous people, and I imagine they're a very different audience for your work and understand it differently. And my other question is about, um, a related question is about you know, maybe have you seen the responses in the art world change since you've been working? Um, are, are people more or less receptive to your work? I, I'm just curious about the changes. Okay. Yeah, audience. Well, I think that, well, that the flipping of the native host is one way to kind of, I call it a puncture, you know, and Dennis Adams kind of coined that phrase in public art. You need to puncture society and maybe you make them hurt a little bit. You know, they look and see, well, what was that? And, you know, and then they, they start to see what's been discussed. And so flipping it, it makes people perplexed sometimes. And they don't even know it's, it's a tri, it's a state or a province or whatever. And, uh, and you got to put it out there like a, like a definitive governmental sign. And you mimic the power. You mimic the power that makes signs and stop signs, yield signs, and all those kind of things, parking signs. And so I, I, I take on that role to mimic the power, you know, but twist it around a different way and, uh, and put it out on the, on the public realm. And so, and in some ways that when that happens with the vandalism, uh, that's part of the discussion. Uh, when they start tearing it up and dragging it off to their dorm rooms, I think that's the discussion's not going so well, but, but when they graffiti on, I say, leave it alone, but you leave it up there. So it's, it's a, it's a discourse or, or it's a dialogue, you know, with public art. Um, and I, but yeah, people have gotten what well, with the land acknowledgments has been kind of trendy thing, but uh, uh, the world's gotten a lot more cozy with my work. I mean that you know, and uh, but I think the work's gotten better, particularly the printmaking pieces and the paintings. And I think I've I've got kept extending my reach, uh, but the printmaking I think is going very well, and so it's been collected. Uh, you know, MoMA has collected forty eight prints and. Uh, the, the Tate Modern is just finishing up collecting 48 prints, and the LACMA, same, and the Carnegie Triennial, the same, and Chicago Art Institute. And so the work is in all the major collections now. It's moving toward toward that. And uh, and I'm proud of that. You know, I'm proud that that, that, will, that will stand as a, as a voice. And, that, and that's where I, I sell work, not to private collectors as much, but to people that, well, it's groups that are going to show it and share it, you know, with the world. And I have two foundations I'm working with, and they're totally about sharing the work. They'll, they'll show it for free anywhere in the world. They'll loan it to museums, and one's in Santa Fe, one's in New York, and they acquire major pieces. One, one group bought my whole exhibit, and now it's going to Italy for free. They're shipping it. They're shipping, it's in Naples right now. It'll open in a couple of weeks. Uh, so they're really all about my work being shared with the world. And, and, uh, and so, and with that, speaking of KU, you know, uh, how they've done me, but uh, I've endowed the art department so that there'll always be a native art show every year forever, you know, with, with my, with my earnings. Yeah. Yeah. 
And they, one of my buddies in LA said, yeah, if you want it, you got to buy it. You know? So if you want, if you want the office to be an art show, give them the money and they'll, and there'll be one, you know, and with the interest on the debt, on the earnings. And, and so I, I'm, and my, told my family the other day at Thanksgiving dinner, my brother went to KU, my sister went to KU. I said, the three of us went there. Maybe we didn't all finish, but your name will be up there forever. And then there'll be an art show in your, in your honor, you know, and then that's what the, the, the funds do for me is to give it back. You know? Yeah. What is your greatest hope for your daughter and her future? Oh, what is your greatest hope for your daughter and her future? What do I hope for her? Um, man, she's so artistic, you know, and she's, I don't bother her very much, you know, but I, I, I know how to help an artist and I was a professor for 30 years and I bought a big, big new house and I built her a studio, of course, but that's just off to the side over here. She's 12 years old, she has her own studio. Um, but, but I think she's going to do things with visual art, you know, and she's interested in music. She has a ukulele she plays, you know, I hear the ukulele playing in the room. And, uh, and, but I take her everywhere I go in the world. She's been in Europe. She's been in Asia. She's been all over the Caribbean. She's been all over Mexico and on New York and jazz clubs downtown. And, and I did that for my sons too. So, uh, but I think she's, she's kind of got a lot of talent and she wants to pursue it in a good spirit. She's also very active in the Navajo ceremonies. She's in more of the women's society, puberty ceremony and those things. Really proud of her, her commitment to that. Too. So she has a lot of things to look look ahead for. And I'm just happy to be her dad, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very interested. Years ago, I used to work for the Royal College of Art in the painting school. Can you, can you, I don't know if you yeah, just for a second. I'll do that. The Royal College of Art is somewhere I worked for about four years. Um, you went there? No, I, I was secretary in the painting school. Oh. And, uh, oh, really? Yeah. What year was that? About 1974, I think I was Okay. There. I was so, there like 77. Okay. You might have known some of the same people, but I just would like to know, an artist like you representing what you do, which is astonishing, is marvelous stuff. I just wondered how that went down there and were they as receptive to you as uh, other places where it, it seems to me that you were talking about <laughs> punching a hole in the side of society. That was a place where you have to yeah, punch a yeah, hole. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, ironically enough, I was more of a younger student then, and I was kind of looking for a, a way, and um, I didn't find it yet. You know, so I was making those constructions with the kind of the, the tar paper and the green thing. I was making those. Uh -huh. You know, but but Peter de Francia was my guy. I don't even know uh -huh. Peter de Francia. So Peter de Francia was my guy, and the other the other gentleman was Alan Miller. Alan. Al Alan Miller, painter I Alan don't Miller. Know him, but Peter de Francia was there when I was there. Okay. Yeah. And I my I was um, my boss was Carol Waite, Professor Carol Waite, who left probably just before you came, and then uh, Peter de Francia was not the same person so but he may have been good for the right kind of artist yeah well for me he was he really helped uh he was smart enough to know that you know here's this guy from kansas yes hanging out for a year i had a year kind of uh admission and that's what i wanted and so i can't remember what they call that position but a student would come from somewhere like canada or uh i remember there was uh, an american student a black student who came and they, they would be on a one-year sort of special thing. Is that what you That's did? That's what I had, yeah. And they asked oh, me to stay, yeah. but I wanted to go back to Oklahoma. You know, but, uh, but, but Peter gave me a special scholarship to go run around Europe. And I just took off. Yeah. I took off. Well, he's gone up a whole big degree in my estimation. I oh, yeah. Well, he's very supportive to me. And he, he gave me a list of places to go, yes. collections to see. And I did my best to hit every one of those oh. places. <laughs> it took me like three months to travel all over Europe and, and, uh, and so I guess still go back. I mean, I show in Paris or London or Italy, you know, but, but, but Alan Miller and I got to be buddies and I go to his studio, stay at his house. And, but, but they, they were, you know, they weren't pushy about things, but they, 
we're just kind of saying, well, you might want to look at this. And then, but but when I go back to London, I'm like this, I'm like this uh, superstar. I, you know, they, well, he was so brilliant here. And I wasn't brilliant there. I was just a kid, you know, like, <laughs> oh, look what he's done, you know, but uh, in London, but uh, it's kind of funny. But, you know, it was, it was good. But, but it showed me to go back to Oklahoma. That's what I did. That's marvelous. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Any comments? Anyone. So there's cards up here to give away if you'd like to have some, and thanks for coming. Yeah.